How do you keep score in a space race? There are a few obvious milestones early on, first person in orbit, first spacewalk, first to the moon, but after all those boxes are checked, where do we go? Well, the natural next step was to start living in space and finding out just how long you could stay up there. That means space stations, and if we look at the evolution of human habitation in low Earth orbit, we can get a pretty good idea of who dominated the past and who will take over the future. The answers might surprise you. This is the Space Race. Did you know that the first space station ever deployed was a Soviet design from 1971 called Salyut? It was actually a very impressive piece of hardware at 18 and a half metric tons, 20 meters in length, 4 meters in diameter, and 99 cubic meters in volume. So that's pretty big, even by modern standards. Now, we don't talk about this one very often because there is a deeply tragic story attached to it. The first and only crew to ever visit the Salyut 1 never lived to tell the tale. The three cosmonauts perished on the return trip when their Soyuz capsule depressurized, making them also the first and only humans to have died in space. The operation of Salyut 1 was terminated shortly after. The station was deorbited and burnt up in the atmosphere on October 11, 1971. A year later, the Soviets tried again with a space station module called DOS-2, but this one was lost due to an engine failure on the proton rocket, and it never reached orbital velocity. The whole thing just fell into the ocean. One year after that, the Soviets made their third attempt with Salyut-2. This one did reach orbit, but quickly lost altitude control and depressurized, leaving it to tumble helplessly through space until its orbit decayed and the station burnt up in the atmosphere. Undeterred, the Soviet Union launched yet another space station module in 1973. This was originally intended to be Salyut III, but since a flight control error prevented the station from reaching the correct orbital height, the Soviets quickly renamed the mission to Cosmos 557, and pretended like it was a regular satellite launch and not a failed space station deployment. A week later, the remains fell from space and burnt up in the atmosphere. Meanwhile, through all of this, NASA had been working on their own space station concept named Skylab. With the Apollo program officially brought to an end, NASA was left with one excess Saturn V rocket just kicking around. This incredibly humongous and incredibly powerful machine was purpose-built to send heavy things to the moon. But engineers decided that the Saturn V could be retrofit to deploy one final and truly epic payload into low Earth orbit, a space station. And Skylab was one hell of a space station. NASA hollowed out the S-4B module of the Saturn V, which would have traditionally served as a third propulsion stage for the translunar injection burn. The giant fuel tanks were converted into an orbital workshop with an incredible 6.6 .6 meters in diameter and 14.7 meters in length. Then on top of that, NASA attached an airlock module and docking adapter where the Apollo Space Telescope Observatory was mounted. Then, an unused Apollo Command and Service module was docked at the far end to provide power for the station. Skylab was occupied for a combined total of 171 days across three crewed missions from 1973 to 1974, and it easily holds up as one of the most amazing things ever launched into space. There were plans to eventually use the space shuttle to refurbish and reboost the station to a higher orbit, but unfortunately the shuttle wasn't ready in time, and Skylab's orbit decayed to the point where it finally hit the atmosphere and disintegrated in 1979. We know you are fans of space, so we wanted to share a space travel game you should definitely check out, Solar Expanse. Solar Expanse offers a realistic experience of orbital transfers, space exploration, asteroid mining, early colonization, and partial terraformation. You can find the link to the game in the description below, and there will be a demo too. Back in the Soviet Union, they were finally primed for success. The real Salyut 3 achieved orbit in July 1974 and was successfully visited by the crew of Soyuz 14. 
This station was notable for being the first spacecraft to include a gun. There was a 23mm aircraft cannon attached to the station, and the Soviets would be the first to ever test fire a conventional weapon in space. Anyway, from there, the Soviets had a pretty successful run with these single module space stations from Salyut 3 up to Salyut 7, but for the Soviets, this was only a warm up act. In 1986, the world saw the deployment of the first ever modular space station, which the Soviets named Mir. You may be noticing a trend here. While NASA did manage to deploy one very cool space station with Skylab, it was an incredibly short lived project and it marked the United States' one and only independent space station. We can see pretty clearly here that the Soviets had essentially cornered the market on long-term habitation in low Earth orbit. It took a decade to fully assemble the seven-module Mir station, which would eventually reach a pressurized volume of 350 cubic meters. Now, something interesting happened over the time period that the station Mir was being constructed. The Soviet Union collapsed. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 marked the beginning of the end for the Cold War, and now we enter the period of the Russian space program. This era would bring a newfound cooperation between Western and Eastern superpowers. Now, instead of being engaged in a space race, the Russians and Americans were working together for the betterment of human space exploration. Very positive Star Trek vibes were starting to come out, and in 1993, NASA's space shuttle fleet began regular missions to the Mir station. The shuttle Atlantis even delivered the final docking module to Mir in 1995. Now, as much as NASA was helping out the Russians with the use of their fancy space planes, the Americans were using this opportunity to learn as much as they possibly could about modular space stations and long-term habitation in microgravity a subject where the United States had fallen massively behind. It was in 1984 that President Ronald Reagan originally directed NASA to build an international space station within the next 10 years, and obviously that never happened. So when we finally arrive at the International Space Station that we all know so well today, we can see that it shares a lot of resemblance with Russia's Mir. In fact, given everything that we've just learned, I don't think it's unfounded to look at the ISS more like a Mir version 2.0 because it's pretty clear where this design approach came from. It's also worth noting that the first module of the ISS that was deployed in 1998 was the Russian control module. The Russian side of the station is responsible for the power and propulsion of the ISS, and the first crew to reside on the ISS was one American and two Russians who all arrived there on a Soyuz rocket launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Anyway, I find that all pretty interesting because growing up in North America, we were pretty much led to believe that NASA was really the leader in this whole International Space Station project, and it never really occurred to me until right now that the full two decades of research and development by the Soviets and Russians is what really laid the groundwork for the ISS, and it probably never would have even happened without that, so there's an interesting new perspective for you. The ISS is operated primarily by Roscosmos and NASA. The Russian service module is responsible for guidance, navigation, life support, power and propulsion of the entire station. So it's pretty important. While the NASA side of the station is for operations, logistics and research. The other key players in the ISS are the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, each having their own independent research modules. With the Japanese Kaibo becoming the single largest ISS module, it took three space shuttle missions to get the entire lab into orbit. Following the completion of the ISS in the early 2000s, there has been only one modular space station deployed to Earth orbit, China's Tiangong the Heavenly Palace. With just three modules, the Tiangong is a much smaller scale station than the ISS and even contains slightly less pressurized volume than Mir, but the Tiangong is a significant leap forward in space station design and technology. If we look back from Salyut to Skylab to Mir to ISS, we're not exactly seeing a massive amount of progress or even evolution to the design. If anything, the Skylab really sticks out as being the nicest space station of the bunch, and that was literally 50 years ago. The Soviet design aesthetic that carried over all the way to the ISS 
has a lot more in common with a submarine than the Starship Enterprise. It's cramped, it's cluttered, there are pipes and wires, and god knows what else sticking out from all angles. Now we flip forward to China's Tiangong, and the difference is night and day. There are only about 20 years between ISS and Tiangong, but it looks like a century worth of progress. Obviously, in the time between the year 2000 and the year 2021, a lot of major breakthroughs were made in the field of silicon microchips and transistors, all of our electronic devices got thinner and more powerful, so naturally that transfers over to our spaceships as well. Just look at the SpaceX Crew Dragon interior compared to the space shuttle. But there is a little bit more going on here than just better microchips. The biggest selling point of the ISS was that it would be a fully modular space station, meaning it can be built out one piece at a time, and you can just keep adding on more pieces as you go along. And the ISS has a lot of pieces, 16 pressurized modules in total, and each one of them had to be transported from the ground into orbit. This is why it took over a decade to fully assemble the International Space Station, and NASA's rocket of choice at the time wasn't helping either. The space shuttle had two significant flaws that made it a bad rocket for deploying a space station. Thing number one, it was really dangerous to fly, and in 2003, the shuttle Columbia broke up on re-entry, killing the entire crew and grounding the shuttle fleet until NASA figured out what went wrong. This was extremely bad timing for the construction of ISS, because the workhorse rocket that was intended to do most of the heavy lifting was now out of service right in the middle of the construction project, and even when shuttle service resumed, it never got back to the launch frequency of the 1990s. And the second thing, the shuttle just was not very effective at putting heavy things into space. The shuttle was technically rated for 27 metric tons to low Earth orbit, but the actual payload capacity to ISS altitude was more like 16 metric tons. This presents a significant limitation on a large-scale orbital construction project. The spacious interior of the Skylab module was made possible by the incredible power of the Saturn V, a rocket that could lift 150 metric tons into low Earth orbit. So the difference in headroom between Skylab and ISS is directly attributable to the difference in available lifting power. Even the Tiangong station modules, which technically would have fit inside the shuttle cargo bay, would have been too heavy for the space plane to handle. Those are around 23 metric tons, give or take. So the Tiangong does not suffer from a lot of bottlenecks and size limitations that we find on the ISS. There's much more open and continuous space. And this is a clear indicator for space stations that will come in the future. They are only going to get bigger thanks to significant advancements in heavy lift rocket technology. The SpaceX Starship is the most obvious example of this. With somewhere between 100 and 200 metric tons of payload capacity to low Earth orbit and a 9 meter diameter cargo fairing, the Starship could deploy something even bigger than Skylab in one single launch. And the Starship is designed to operate as a fully reusable and high volume rocket system. So unlike the very limited quantity of Saturn V boosters, Starship can deploy a lot more of these gigantic space station modules as many as we can build, really, SpaceX can launch them. So now we suddenly have the capability to build the equivalent of skyscrapers in space. And there are other really big rockets coming, like the Blue Origin New Glenn booster, which is already attached to the Orbital Reef Space Station project, which will combine massive 7 meter diameter core modules with inflatable habitats from Sierra Space to very quickly offer up three times the pressurized volume of the ISS. So the future is looking pretty amazing for human habitation in space. We're moving quickly from the harsh military aesthetic of a submarine to something that was previously only imaginable in science fiction. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.